talk a little bit about geology today. I call it the rocks cry out geology in the Bible. And it's a fascinating story in the Bible where Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey. His disciples are praising him and crying out, Hosanna, um, you know, the, the, uh, the son of David is coming. And they were using a messianic term. They had palm branches. And you know the story, I'm sure. And um, it's interesting that the, um, the Pharisees and those around took offence, didn't they? they? And they instructed, they said to Jesus, tell your disciples to stop calling out. And Jesus said to some of the Pharisees in the crowd, rebuke your disciples, teacher. And Jesus said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And I think the stones really do cry out to the glory of God. Now, when I was younger, I had absolutely no interest whatsoever in geology. I thought it had to be the most boring subject. I mean, a rock, it just sits there. It does absolutely nothing. Who would be interested in a rock? I was much more interested in the physics and the stuff. And, you know. But I now realise that, in fact, geology is a fantastic witness to the truth of the record of history in the Bible, and that God's word is in fact the truth. So I want to do, I want to share with you a testimony. To start off with this young guy, Rachel. He said a few months ago I started on my high school geology course, and my faith was weakened by the evolutionary arguments presented in it. A few months later, I received quite a number of your books for Christmas. I must say that these books, as well as this website, have greatly strengthened my faith. What a great testimony that is, that the materials that we've been able to provide and get into young people's hands ensure that he kept his faith through the onslaught of basic, basically atheistic teaching, as I shared yesterday. So some of those resources, there's the Creation Magazine um, that I mentioned briefly yesterday, and I'll talk a, bit of it, a little bit more about that later on. And some of the illustrations and things I'm going to use today have come from past issues of the magazine. And of course, there's that famous website with the very easy web address. Creation.com. Creation.com, there it is. You've all got to pass the exam at the end of the camp. I can see that. So what we're talking about really in this camp is inviting you to change the glasses with which you see the world. Remember we talked about world views yesterday. We're taught in our culture that everything happens by chance that we can explain the existence of the universe without God. And when we look at the world, we see evidence of millions of years, random processes, death always present, and so on. And the invitation is to take off those evolutionary glasses and take God's word as the authority. And then, when we look at the world around us, we see it quite differently. We see evidence of only thousands of years, no death before creative kinds, dinosaurs, living with humans we talked about last night, and of course Noah's flood. So all of that comes from, of course, God's Word, the history book of the universe. And it begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it then proceeds to lay out in the opening chapters of Genesis a timeline that takes us all the way from Adam through from that time as far as Abraham. And that's a span of about 2,000 years. And you can actually just add all those numbers up. They're all given to us there in the book of Genesis. From the time of Abraham through to the time of King David and then by the line of Mary and the line of Joseph, we can get all the way to the time of Jesus. Now, we don't have all of the ages of all the people, so it's not as precise as the top line is. But we know from history and from the biblical record that the time span from Abraham to the time of Jesus is about 2,000 years. And I know what to say, from Adam to Abraham is about 2,000 years also. And of course, from the time of Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. So what that means is that according to the Bible, and not my idea, but according to God's word, here we stand today, about 6,000 years after the creation. And that's a pretty stunning result, isn't it, compared to what we're taught, and you turn on the TV and look at a documentary and we'll hear about the millions and millions of years and so on. But how do people determine age? You know, age 
is not something that you can measure. When scientists look at the fossil remains of bones and things, they can look at its physical characteristics, but you can't measure age. And let me demonstrate for you. Come with me on a bit of a, a thought experiment. Let's say that you've just come around the corner of your house into your backyard, and there, under a bucket, uh, under a tap rather, a dripping tap, is a bucket that's partly filled with water. Now, you can't help yourself being scientifically inclined, as you do. You measure the volume of water in the bucket and the rate at which the tap is dripping, and you discover the tap's dripping at half a litre every hour, and the bucket has six litres of water in it. So you ask yourself this very important question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? Now, is anyone good at mathematics? So, what's the average? This is 12 hours. What's the drip rate? 12 hours? Half a litre per hour. What's the temperature and evaporation rate? Well, 12 hours seems pretty reasonable. You make the measurements and you do the calculation, you get 12 hours. But to get 12 hours, you have to make some assumptions. Years. Nobody, nobody, nobody emptied, emptied, emptied the bucket in the meantime. Sorry? No but one nobody emptied the bucket in the meantime and sucked yeah. back over. And the dog then comes and slips. They might have a leak. The bucket might have a leak. Yeah. And the obvious one, you don't know, it's been dripping at the same rate all the time, then. Yeah. Remember, you've just chanced upon the scene, haven't you? You've mm. just come around the corner and there it is. You do the measure. Like all science, we do measurements in the present. We were not there in the past to see what was happening to that bucket, but we happen to be in luck because you have a very important backyard and you have a resident historian who faithfully records all the events that have been happening in your backyard. And the historian comes to you and says that at 10 a.m. the bucket was placed under the tap and at 2 p.m. you arrived on the scene. So now you have to answer the question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? Anyone want to have a go back? Four hours. Four hours. Well now, hang on a minute. One might say, hey, well, I'm a scientist. <laughs> and I've got some really fancy equipment. And you know what? When you measure the volume of water in the bucket and the rate at which the tap is driven, actually, it wasn't 12 hours. It was really 11.973261 hours, right down to the nearest microsecond. So with all my amazing technology, I mean, you're just a historian. How would you know, right? <laughs> so am I any closer to the truth with all my clever technology and measurement ability? So who's right, the historian or the scientist? Who thinks the historian? And who thinks the scientist? Well, why do you think the scientist? But we have assumed that here, and it is an assumption, we have a reliable line. Or it's not lying. We're assuming that it's not lying. That's right. So we have a truthful historian here who has recorded that it went under the bucket, the tap went under the, the bucket went under the tap at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. you arrive on the scene. So four hours, the eyewitness, the reliable eyewitness, always wins when you're trying to determine the age of something. Because making measurements in the present does not allow you, without making assumptions, to determine the past. And how do you make your assumptions arrive? Because how do you know where the bucket was empty when it went under the tap? You don't, you weren't there. How do you know the drip rate was being constant? You don't, because you weren't there. So you have to make a whole raft of assumptions, and you can arrive at an age or a time. But the problem is this. <coughs> Age can't be measured. Age is only ever calculated, and, they, and the age you get depends on the assumptions that you make. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got an age that you did not like, or didn't fit what you believed it to be, you can adjust your assumptions so that the calculation does work. And I'm going to give you an example of that uh, happening in just a little while. Assumptions about the past cannot be scientifically verified because you can't observe them. It's in the past. It's gone. You weren't there. You can't control the environment. Um, you just don't know. 
age can only be determined accurately by a reliable historical record. That's a very important point to remember. Now, we are told the ages of rocks and fossils with much authority and with much precision. But the fact is, those ages are based upon assumptions. So the question you need to always ask, what history is assumed when that person has given you an age? What history has been assumed? So what is science about? Well, it's the systematic study of man's environment based on deductions and inferences which can be made and general laws which can be formulated from reproducible observations and measurements of events. Now, reproducible means it has to be able to be repeated. Observations and measurements all happen in the present. And all we have is the present. So we observe the present and then we make inferences about the past based on assumptions which we cannot test. Now, remember yesterday we talked about the nature of science, how experimental science is based on experiments, and that's the kind of science which gives us all the amazing technology that we enjoy today. But then there's historical science in which the scientist tells a story about the past to explain what he's observing in the present. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that, except you have to remember that when you tell a story about the unobserved past, you're reflecting what you already believe about the past. Okay, so the scientist's belief system now influences his interpretation. So just summarising that quickly, experimental science is about the present, it's about observable and repeatable experiments. And you know there is never a disagreement between the Bible <coughs> and experimental science. Never. But in historical science, which is about the unobservable, unrepeatable past, that's where the difference comes. That's where the conflict arises. And why does it arise there? Well, as we explained yesterday, one belief system starts with the assumption there's no God, and you can explain the entire universe in just natural terms. Random processes over billions and billions of years. The other approach says there is a God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible, as God's history book, outlines for us the time scales and all the key events that have happened since creation. So no wonder there's a conflict because those two worldviews, if you like, are radically different from each other. And so when you look at the evidence, you're going to see completely different results. Now often we're told that radiometric dating, a matter of fact, Jenny and I went to, I think I mentioned yesterday, I went to the uh, Royal Tyrrell Museum in Canada, which is one of the world's most famous dinosaur museums. And there's a sign there that talks about dating, and it says radiometric dating is an absolute dating method, which is an extraordinary thing to say because they know full well that it is not. <laughs> and no paleontologist or geologist relies solely on radiometric dating. They always look for other evidence in the field because different methods of doing radiometric dates give different results. I'll share in a minute. So it absolutely is not an absolute dating method. It's really um, yeah, quite uh, reprehensible that they had such a sign in the museum. But this is the kind of misleading stuff that you come across. So radiometric dating is a bit like an hourglass. There's a radiometrically uh, unstable element, which we call the parent element, which decays and produces what's called the, uh, the daughter element, and it decays at a certain rate. Now, the idea is that you uh, measure the ratio of the parent element to the daughter element in your sample, and if you know what that ratio is, you can then calculate the age. But you have to make some assumptions, just like the bucket under the dripping tap. <laughs> so what assumptions have to be made before you can calculate an age? The rate of the sand dropping through? The rate of the decay, you have to assume, is constant. But That's the actual ratio of the parent and the daughter element in the original sample. Exactly. You don't know the initial conditions. How much parent element was there to begin with? How much daughter element was there to begin with? That's a good one. Yeah. Did any leak out? Exactly. Some could have been lost. Um, things like uranium salts, for instance, are water soluble. They can be leached into or out of rocks. Yeah? So if you think about it, you've got a whole bunch of assumptions 
None of which you can test because you don't know what was happening to your sample in the past. You were there. So you don't know the initial quantity, you don't know if some of the parent elements have been added or subtracted. Likewise with the daughter element. Scientists usually assume that all the daughter element is due to the parent elements called radiogenic. But it may not be, it could have been there right at the beginning. Is and we don't right? actually know that the decay rate is a constant. Mm. There is some interesting evidence that suggests that radioactive decay rates do vary, which is really quite significant. But what we can do is we can take some rocks of known age and test them using some radioelectric dating methods. Now, how do you get a rock of known age? Well, the best way is to take some lava from a volcano. And if you have an eruption which occurred on a known date, how do you know it's known? Because it was observed, right? And someone wrote the date down, so it becomes an historical record now. And when the lava solidifies, there's a clock called the potassium argon clock that begins to tick. Argon is an inert gas, it'll bubble out of molten lava, but it gets trapped in the solidified lava. So this clock should give us an indication of the age of the lava, and it's commonly used uh, in that application. So here are some examples. Mount St. Helen erupted in 1980. Rock from the lava <coughs> dome, several samples were taken, and the age is determined to be anywhere from 350,000 years to 2.8 million years old. But the rocks at the time were only about 10 years old. Kilauea in Hawaii, a known eruption about 200 years ago. Rocks from the lava dome dated anywhere from 0 to 22 million years old. And another one, Wawai, uh, similarly about 200 years ago. <clears throat> and rocks dated between 160 million and 3.3 billion years old. Now, what you're seeing here is the wrong results for rocks that are of a known age. And it's interesting, in the scientific journals, the scientists say um, things like uh, the dating of, uh, of young rocks is notoriously difficult, they say. But let's think about that. You don't know if it's a young rock or an old rock. Therefore, how do you know if it's notor notoriously difficult or not? See, they're kind of trying to, to reel out against so if you get the wrong result for a rock which has a known age, why well, would you be confident of the age of a rock of unknown age? Now, there's some other examples I can give you. Um, in uh, Queensland, a place called Crimmon, there's a mine. Some 21 metres down, they encountered a layer of basalt, a solidified lava, and it flowed around or through a forest. And there was still wood left from the forest, so they drew up the samples, the wood was carbon dated between 44 and 45,000 years old, but potassium argon dating on the basalt had 45 million years, a factor of a thousand older. But they must be about the same age because the lava had flowed through the forest and the wood was still there, charred. So you'd expect different dating methods to give about the same result for things which must be about the same age. Here's another one, a piece of uh, Hawkesbury sandstone. Um, it was found to uh, have a piece of wood encased inside it. The wood was carbon dated at 34,000 years, but the fossil age of the Hawkesbury sandstone is 230 million years. So how could you have something so young totally embedded within something much older than it? See, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. This quote, I think, shines a bit of a light on it. If a carbon-14 batch supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in the footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Now, I'm not trying to have a go at scientists here because I am one, but what, what you're seeing happen here is how the belief system work. Right? These guys already know, quite unquote, or believe they're going to get a certain date. And when they get something completely different, well, what do you do with that? Now, these dating processes cost quite a bit of money for laboratory, so you've probably got a research grant, you can't send it all back and do it again, you haven't got enough money. So you rationalise it, you say things like, well, maybe there were some impurities. Um, maybe the, uh, the lab equipment was out of calibration, so we can something with the laboratory. Or maybe the uh, lab technician had morning tea in the middle and uh, got it wrong or something. 
But whatever it is, we know that there's something wrong with the results. If we include those numbers in our paper, it won't get published. Because the reviewers will say, boy, oh, you can't have that, that's obviously a wrong date. And so the review process locks in the paradigm. Can you see how that works? Peer review is supposed to weed out false signs. But actually what it does is preserve the paradigm. And uh, you know, so here's some examples of how carbon 14 is actually a friend of a biblical creationist. Diamonds are supposed to be between one and three billion years old. Now maybe some of you might be wearing a, a diamond a ring. And uh, now if it's that old, there can't possibly be any carbon-14 inside a diamond because carbon-14 decays quite rapidly. Some half-life of about, um, you know, sort of half-life of about 5,700 years. So in something in the order of 60 to 80,000 years, there'd be absolutely no detectable carbon-14 left inside any sample at all. Certainly not after one to three billion years. So nobody had ever done carbon-14 tests on diamonds until some scientists had sent off a whole bunch of samples to a laboratory and you saw a carbon-14 was found in every single sample in significant quantities. Not just impurity level or something like that, but significant amounts indicating that the diamonds are only thousands of years old. It was a stunning result. It also turns up regularly, although I've had an article in our creation magazine, we called it Diamonds, a creationist's best friend. Um, it also turns up routinely in coal, which is supposedly um, tens or so, 30 to 300 million years old. Consequently, it couldn't have any carbon 14 present, but sure enough, every single sample indicating an age of only thousands of years for the coal. So this is totally inconsistent with the narrative, with the evolutionary story that we're told. In fact, coal, I think, is a fantastic witness to the flood. Here, not far away in the Latrobe Valley, the coal measures are 700 metres thick. They contain partly decomposed vegetation, and it's all consistent with massive flooding having, ha having happened in the past. Now, there's a theory about the formation of coal or a generally accepted one, is the swamp theory. The idea is that you have a tranquil swamp and leaves and branches and stuff fall into the, the, uh, the swampy water. They get slowly compressed over millions of years and then they get cold. But the problem is that that theory fails because there is no soil under the cobble, which you'd need to have to support the forest, but pure clay and no roots. Horizontal ash layers run through those beds of coal. And ash comes from volcanoes. Volcanoes are not tranquil, are they? That's a violent process that's happened there. And there are large pine tree trunks distributed randomly through the um, Latrobe Valley coal, including King Billy pines, which incidentally don't grow in swamps. So the swamp theory does not get observations support. But I think coal is an amazing testament. By the way, did you know that coal can be made rapidly in a laboratory? The most important factor is temperature, and you need the substance of lignin, which is the um, cellular structure of wood, water, and clay heated to only 150 degrees C, produce brown coal in a matter of months. And if you do it at higher temperatures, you can produce very high quality anthracite or black coal. So they can actually make it in a laboratory in a short time, and it's not very difficult in terms of the conditions. 400 C and a bit of pressure, the right ingredients, and presto, you get high quality coal. My colleague, Taz Walker, said, if ever there was a geological phenomenon that should remind us of Noah's flood, it's coal. Coal points to a global catastrophe because huge quantities of vegetation have been uprooted, transported, and buried by water under great volumes of sediment all over the world. Now in Genesis chapter 6, 7 and 8, there's a global catastrophic flood described. The evidence is consistent with that. Now in case you're misunderstanding me, I'm not trying to prove the Bible with science, because you can't do that. 
And the reason is this. If I was making science the benchmark and testing the Bible against it, that is exalted science above Scripture. But it's actually the other way around. God's Word, which is truth, gives us a historical record which we use to interpret the world around us. So what I'm pointing out here is all of this evidence is consistent with the biblical historical record. It doesn't prove it, but it strengthens our confidence that the Bible is indeed God's Word. There's an interesting example of how radiometric dating has to be subservient to the belief system, to the paradigm. And uh, there's a lady called Kate Berensmeyer, and she discovered a volcanic tooth called the KBS Tuff after her name. It's in uh, eastern Africa, and uh, it's just a volcanic ash layer. Now, that's, I mean, volcanic ash layers are found everywhere. But it's important because it's associated with a whole variety of fossils. Elephant fossils, pig, ape, and tools. That's rather interesting. But there's Kate. But this, uh, this tool was dated using potassium argon at 212 to 230 million years old. And the dating, well, I've got it here, uh, was done by Finch and Miller at the Cambridge Laboratory. So you've got the world's best here. So you can't really say the laboratory was slack. Okay, these guys are in this top dogs. There's a problem, however, because there are tools associated with this. And you can't have tools that many millions of years ago. So the date's obviously wrong, right? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. So they took some other samples and they found some feldspar and some pumice and they did more potassium argon dating. This time they got 2.61 million years old. Notice the precision, 2.61 million years old before this, uh, this uh, okay, very small tool. And What's more, they confirmed it with two other dating methods using paleomagnetism and a method called fish and traps. And that was great. And everybody thought, well, there you go. You've got three lines of scientific investigation all lining up, demonstrating that it's actually about almost 10 times younger than we originally thought, and that fits in with having tools around it, right? But then along came Richard Leakey, and Richard Leakey discovered particular skull, very famous one, KNER 1470, and uh, that's a problem because it's too modern a skull to be that old. Once again, it doesn't fit the paradigm in the story. So they thought, well, that can't be right there. They'll scrap that date, so we'll do it again. So they sample again, and they found some and other samples. Now they've got 1.82 million years old. And that's a much better date because that now fits the, the narrative of, of human evolution. So I hope you can kind of pick up, and by the way, it was confirmed using paleomagnetism and magnetism tracks. I hope you see there's a certain irony going on here. So time, and then finally, it settled on that date because now it matched the, uh, the condition, the status, if you like skull. But the point to make here is that it was the paradigm that determined the age. But what's the paradigm? It's just the belief system that's the evolutionary story. And what's the evolutionary story based on? The assumption there's no God and we have to explain the entire universe in purely natural terms. That assumption drove all of this. Not the science. The measurements were accurate, the calculations were precise, they discarded the result because it didn't fit the parallel. I hope you can see how powerful beliefs are. That's why it's so important, folks, that we build our beliefs on the only rock solid foundation there is, which is the Word of God. The eyewitness testimony from the God who doesn't lie, who is a reliable witness, and who's told us exactly what he did right from the beginning. There was a time when people generally believe the Bible. This is an old King James version of the Bible. There's a margin note next to Genesis 1, verse 1. And it puts an age of about 4000 BC, about 4004, which is a date that Bishop James Usher came up with. 
Um, we can't reproduce those results because Usher had access to documents which we now don't have. But there's a whole variety of scholars have looked at this and have come up with ages in that general vicinity. We don't know precisely. The Bible doesn't allow us to determine that date precisely from Scripture. But about that, approximately 4,000 BC. And in fact, in the Shakespearean play, As You Like It, which was written between 1598 and 1600, there's a line from Act 4, Scene 1, where Rosalind says, the poor world is almost 6,000 years old. There you have it. So right back there, even in Shakespearean times, it was accepted what the age of the earth is. And the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which came out in 1771, included a table of remarkable eras and events. The creation of the world, well, they got a slightly different date, but 4,000 BC again. But then you, you'll know it's fun. 2351 BC, or in the year of the world, 1656, which you'll remember yesterday morning was a date you derived from the scriptures. Isn't that amazing? And then, a little later in that article, they had a depiction of what Noah's Ark might have looked like. But today, if you go on the website of Encyclopedia Britannica, they'll say, there is probably no other notion in any field of science that has been as extensively tested and as thoroughly corroborated as the evolutionary origin of living organisms. <laughs> That's a bit of a shift, isn't it? A radically different position now. But I hope you see the kind of corroboration that happens when the data doesn't fit the paradigm, the paradigm wins and the data gets discarded. So what is it that changed England into a pagan nation? I think you could probably say the West actually for this. And this is a quote from a guy who uh, was the curator of the Museum of History of Science at Oxford. <coughs> I myself had a little doubt that in England it was geology and the theory of evolution which changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. And you know, friends, we live in a pagan nation. We don't live in a Christian nation. We live in a very secular uh, culture that basically rejects God. But geology, interestingly, got its real big kickstart from a guy called Nicholas Steno, who was a six-day biblical creationist. And uh, if you're really good at uh, Italian, you might be able to read the title of his book, but basically he was the father of stratigraphy, looking at the stratigraphic layers in the rocks that we see. But in the late 1700s, a man called James Hutton came on the scene, and uh, he wrote a book called The Theory of the Earth, and in that book he said the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. And there's an interesting philosophy expressed here. I wonder if you can pick it up. First of all, must be. So he's now mandating this is how we have to view geology. But what he's saying is you have to explain everything in terms of what you can see happening now. Now that's called uniform materialism. What you can see happening now has been happening all the way back in the past without change. Now what it does is it actually denies the very possibility of a catastrophic event in the past, which is not happening now. Now it's pretty obviously a false philosophy because we know darn well there are such things as volcanic eruptions. <laughs> and the, uh, the results of those are catastrophic and we see them everywhere. But nonetheless, that philosophy persisted and in the middle 1800s, Charles Lyell, who was actually a lawyer, he published, um, I think it was a three-volume work called The Principles of Modern Geology, and he said it's an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. So you make observations now, and you explain everything in terms of the processes that you can see. But in a letter to a friend, he admitted that his objective was to free the science of geology, that is, from Moses. Moses, of course, wrote the first five chapters of the Bible, including the book of Genesis. So when we look at landscapes, like the Glasshouse Mountains in Queensland, you've ever seen those just north of Brisbane? Magnificent features, aren't they? They're quite dramatic, as you can see. And uh, there will be these um, little explanatory signs around the place. So this is the one here at the, uh, the Glasshouse Mountains, and it says, 
uh, down the bottom here, how they were formed. The glass house mountains were once lava plugs with, within volcanic cones. The volcanic cones and surrounding lands were sandstone where he wrote it, got wind and water over 25 million years mm -hmm. to reveal the lava plugs that you can see today. Now, I would say that everything in that description is correct except the time. And the reason I would say except the time is because there isn't 25 million years in the history of the world. How do I know that? Because the eyewitness who doesn't lie tells me. And he spelled out exactly by father, son, father, son, ages, all the way up to Abraham and through, essentially, we can determine to the present day. So there were volcan volcanoes there, and there was erosion, but I think the erosion happened spectacularly and rapidly. And in fact, the evidence suggests that. And everywhere we look in the world, we see these layers and layers of water. And the usual interpretation is that each layer is laid down by some kind of an event, a flood or whatever, and then another layer is deposited on top of that sometime later, and then another, and then another, and it all builds up over millions and millions of years. And then, in the case of Grand Canyon, along comes the Colorado River, and it slowly carves out this massive canyon. Look you know, how much has been eroded away. That must have taken millions of years to form. Or did it? Well, let's take a closer look. Here's the boundary between the Coconino sandstone at the top and the urban formation underneath. And you can see that it's a very, very sharply defined boundary. Now, it's believed that there's a 10 million year gap between those two layers. So how did the geologists get themselves to that conclusion. Well, if you look further south from the Grand Canyon, I'll just finish this story and I'll come back. If you look further south from the Grand Canyon, you can see up there the Coconino sandstone at the top. Underneath is the Hermit Formation, and the central part is called the Schneckley Hill Formation. So interposed between those two, there is now another layer of rock. So let me, um, and that's presumably, they believe, it's taken 10 million years to deposit all of that material. So that's where the 10 million year age came from. So if we just do a diagram of that, there's that uh, what's called a parrot uniformity or a flat gap between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shard, Hermit Formation. And over there on the right, you can see that Schneebly Hill Formation has been injected, um, representing 10 million years. Now across the top, you'll see today's highly eroded surface. So if that layer had been there for 10 million years, why would it not also be highly eroded? Surely it would look something like that. You'd expect massive erosion to have taken place. But instead of that, it's dead flat. So that would say, because there's no sign of erosion, that there's no evidence for that vast period of elapsed time. In fact, what it suggests is that the layers were deposited one after the other, perhaps even simultaneously, very rapidly indeed. So yes, ma'am. I was asking if you've been to the Grand Canyon and if you have, what's really cool? The Grand Canyon is a fantastic place to go. Mm -hmm. You really ought to go. Jenny and I went there. Line up, Jack. I was waiting for that. <laughs> you, can, you can take um, mule rides down the train on the side of the canyon all the way to the bottom. Or you can go on rafts through the... Now, we didn't do that. We got yeah, one. You, know, you can raft down it, yes. Then oh, I'll down down the edge of the Jenny and I went there in a, a January. Jenny and I went there in a January, so it was mid-winter. And we sort of ankle deep snow on the southern rim as we looked down into this. It's oh, just wow. a breathtaking thing. Mm -hmm. Fantastic to see. Is yes. snow in America? Why is it called it? Well, it's just a little bit of a man that it's always got like the, the one that makes artificial snow. Oh, oh, oh this, is, this is a real star. It's quite high, actually. The altitude is quite high. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit quickly about Mount St. Helens that erupted, erupted in 1980. Um, and this is a, a moderately modest volcano, as volcanoes go, but it caused significant geological change around the base of the mountain. And uh, it was a phenomenal blast. It removed something like, I can never remember that, I've had a name of it there, it was 
over a cubic kilometre of the top um, section of the mountain, blew up early one Sunday morning um, with tremendous force. And it left behind complete changes in the geology, including this structure called Engineers Canyon. Now, Engineers Canyon was formed a couple of years after the initial eruption. So all of this material that's here was deposited in the course of the eruption. And we know that because it was observed. It wasn't there before and it was there after. It all came as a result of the material blasted out of the mountain, including a massive amount of ash all mixed in with it. There was a, um, a controlled release of a build-up of water in Spirit Lake, which drained through this uh, material that had been deposited there for about 10 years. And uh, over a, a short time, uh, for some months, I think, this canyon was carved out by that flood of water. So they call it Engineers Canyon. You can see the water still flowing in the bottom. But what's interesting is to look at the side. So what you're looking at here is material that was all deposited there in the volcanic blast in May of 1980. So the lower section, uh, actually, I'll, I'll just have to correct that. It's not exactly right. The lower bit was deposited in the initial blast on the 18th. And then across the top, there was a subsequent, there were several eruptions actually in Mount St. Helens. Mm -hmm. About a month later, on the 12th of June, there was what's called a pyroclastic flow that deposited that layer up there. And then the last bit was a mud flow in 1982. So you can see those three layers. And when you look closely at that pyroclastic flow, you discover that you can see those fine laminations. Now, typically, when geologists look at those fine laminations, they say, well, each one was laid down by a single event. So that must have taken a long time to deposit. But that particular layer is about eight metres thick, and it was all deposited on that day in one event. You see, you don't need vast periods of time to lay down all of these layers. We've observed them to happen rapidly. So when you look at these sharply defined layers, see how eroded the surface is, and yet the layers are faintly revealed all the way through. So they must have been laid down rapidly, essentially all at once, and then it's been slowly eroded away subsequently. Just south of Sydney, there's a beach um, with a rock face, and I'm just pointing out there the different layers. You can see some sedimentary rock at the bottom, then there's a, a volcanic ash layer, and then a coal bearing deposit in volcanic ash, more coal, more ash, more coal, and then some uh, mudstone a sedimentary layer on top of that again. So what that speaks of is a catastrophic event, sharply defined layers, punctuated by volcanic eruptions, very violent, and lots of vegetation compressed and buried in the process to give the coal bearing. So rather than speaking of slow, gradual processes, it speaks of massive and dramatic processes. Here, once again, you can see those layers. Now, there's been some tilting here. So the layers have been deposited. Then they've been tilted up because of crustal movements. And then the top eroded over the years subsequently. And here, the bundle bundle range in WA, you can see that the lines around them. And each of those layers, you can project through the bundles dead flat, so it's all laid down flat and then carved out rapidly, most likely at, as the floodwaters receded. Also, interestingly, running through multiple layers are called what are called polystrate fossils. These are fossils that reach multiple strata. Now, the fossil tree trophy you can see there has a couple of distinguishing things. Firstly, it has no roots, so the tree has been ripped out of where it was growing, transported dumped into all of that freshly deposited sediment and there it's been set. Now if those layers had built up over it over thousands of years, the tree trunk would have rotted away long since, right? Mm -hmm. So the mere existence of a polystrate fossil speaks of rapid processes. And polystrate fossil trees are found in all kinds of locations all around the world. And here you see some spectacular folding of sedimentary rock layers. Once it was all laid out flat, and then the Bible says that the subsidence of the flood, the mountains rose up, the valleys sank down, the crust would have been pushed, buckled, uplifted, distorted in all kinds of ways, and he is still preserved. Now, has anyone here ever tried to bend a rock? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
What happens if you bend a rock? It just shatters, doesn't it? Right? But there's no sign of shattering in there at all. Those layers are beautifully preserved, so they must have still been waterlaid, soft, plastic, and bent and preserved their structure. Where is that? Now, buried in those sedimentary rocks, as we touched on yesterday morning, are uh, all these amazing living, once living things, now very dead, of course, the fossil record. And uh, it all shows signs of rapid burial. And I think I shared another example of fish eating a fish yesterday. But you see, when a fish eats a fish, it doesn't take hundreds of years, right? It's just as quick as anything. Um, and there, this little fish is in the middle of breakfast and it's been dumped on by all this sediment and trapped there in the rocks. I love this one, it's amazing. This is a school of fish, fossilised, but still swimming in formation. Now think about that. <laughs> if that had, and, and you know, the scientists in their articles say, oh, you know, maybe it was caught, the fish were caught in a shallow pool which dried up and left the, the bodies, but you see, they wouldn't be in formation, they would all be struggling randomly trying to get out. That beautiful formation, still there, all preserved, all going the same way, and then boom, just dumped on. Rapid burial. And here's a Congo lion, trilobites, all marching along. Once again, must have happened rapidly, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have uh, lined themselves up so neatly. So, to make a fossil, we need some special conditions. What's the first one? Remember, we talked about it yesterday. What's the first condition you need to make a fossil? Rapid burial. Rapid burial. Thank you. Go top of the class again. Very good. To get a lot in on it. <laughs> Got your lollies, Jim? Oh, sorry about that. No lollies. The lollies are off. <laughs> right, got a rabbit burial so that you stop other animals eating the body, right? Lack of predation. You've got to deprive it of oxygen so the body doesn't rot. So it's got to be deeply buried. And you have to continue to accumulate the sediment on top. Because if you don't, predators will dig the body up. They'll smell it and dig it up. So all of that is consistent with the flood. So what that tells us is that the rock layers must have formed rapidly because they have fossils in them consistently all around the world. Sedimentary rocks typically have fossils. So geologists have thought, well, if the layers form rapidly, where's the time? Perhaps the time is between the layers in the transitions, in the gaps. Maybe that's where the millions of years lie. But there's a problem here too, because in the gaps we find what are called ephemeral markings. Things like fossilised raindrops, you can see the imprint, you can see animal tracks. But you have to bury those quickly. Ripple marks, if you've been down to the beach and you can see the ripple marks on the shoreline, how long do they last? Until the next tide, right? Tide comes in, sand gets all you know, rearranged, you get a whole new pattern. So here are some ripple marks. Calvary National Park, a layer of rock has been deposited on top of the ripple marks, beautifully preserved. But it must have happened quickly for that. Here are some animal tracks also in <coughs> Calvary National Park. So that means there can't be any time between the layers. Because if there was, you wouldn't have those ephemeral fossil remains. So the ephemeral fossil suggests there's no time between the layers. So if there's no time between the layers and no time in the layers, millions of years are simply not in the rocks. Rocks don't show evidence of vast periods of time. Typically they show evidence of catastrophic and rapid formation and we find it all around the world. I want to share with you quickly a, a way of interpreting geology. This uh, is the work of my colleague Dr. Kaz Walker. And he produced a biblical geological model, which I think is really helpful. So here we've got a timeline of, of world history about the creation. And then uh, we have the flood, which occurred about 16, 1700 years after the creation. The time of Jesus and then the present day. So the creation is shown there uh, in green. And during the, the creation time, God was making the planet. He was making the, uh, the, the, the rock, the crust layers and so on, and um, drawing the dry land out of the oceans, etc. 
During the flood, there must have been enormous geological activity taking place as the plates we talked about just over the bottom of the plates were fracturing, the massive volcanic eruptions, the torrential rain for 40 days and 40 months. Subsequent to the flood, there's been progressive but relatively slow geological activity punctuated by an occasional volcano. So let's convert that instead of a time scale into a rock scale. Okay, so the rock scale now looks like this. So enormous amount of geological activity creation, some geological uh, activity between then and the flood, an enormous amount of activity during the flood, and some post the flood. Right, you're getting the, the concept of what we're doing here. We're trying to map a time scale into a rock scale. So bearing that in mind, when we look at large scale rock formations, they either are the result of likely creation or the flood. So let's have a look now at the Grand Canyon. There are flat layers in the Grand Canyon. They're on a massive scale. So they'll fall rapidly on a large scale. So are they creation rocks or are they, are they flood rocks? Well, the rocks contain fossils. So they can't be creation rocks. Because remember, there was no death in the original created order, was there? Death came as a result of what? Adam's sin, right, which came after the creation, obviously. So they can't be creation rocks. Therefore, they must be flood rocks. So we can say confidently, the Grand Canyon rocks were formed during the flood. <coughs> now, we get a bit more sophisticated than that. <clears throat> and there are various stages of the flood. The floodwaters would have been rising initially, inundating the surface of the earth and depositing much of the, um, the sedimentary rock layers that we see. And then, after the floodwaters reached their peak, they receded. And in the recessive stage, you would see a lot of erosion activity taking place, valleys and, and so on. <clears throat> so you would have had an inundatory stage and a recessive stage. So, when were the Grand Canyon rocks formed? Well, they contain footprints in between the layers. That means there are animals that were alive. So it couldn't have been the recessive stage, because if that was so, then animals would have survived the flood. They must therefore have been in the inundatory stage. So we can say that the Grand Canyon rocks were formed as the waters rose on the surface of the earth. And then even more sophisticated, <laughs> We can go into much more detail. <coughs> Don't panic, I'm not going to go through all of these. But if you look at the recessive stage, initially you'd have vast sheets of water flowing off the continents, and then as the waters shallowed down, they would tend to channelise and cut out canyons and valleys in the dispersive phase. So initially they would cut vast flat plains. Isn't it interesting that? In Central Australia, the Canadian prairies, the Russian steppes, in the African savannas, we find huge flat areas which geologists recognise were formed by water. But today, when we see water acting on a landscape, it digs out channels and gullies and valleys. It doesn't deposit vast flat areas, right? But we see, here's the three systems again, there's a planation surface. It's a flat top, but massive erosion has happened in the dispersive phase of the flood. And we see that all around the world. This is Monument Valley in Utah. See the planation surfaces and then there's massive erosion. <coughs> planation surfaces again, massive erosion around the canyon. And near south of Sydney in the southern highlands you see again planation surface and massive erosion through the valleys. But not only that, there are some fascinating yes. Actually, I lived in the Peak District in England. I did. And I used to go down the caverns and you'd find shellfish. Right. Just so. Yeah. And in fact, there are marine fossils in the Himalayas. It's from the Which also demonstrates that it was mm -hmm. once underwater, like, consistent with the biblical record of the flood. Now, another interesting phenomenon that we see, and we've touched on this quickly, is called water gaps. And a water gap is when a river flows through a gap in a mountain. Now, this is a real puzzle because how does that, the mountain regions obviously form their first, you can tell that geologically, but cut through the middle of the thing is a river. How did the river erode 
does it flow up and over the top and slowly erode down the I mean, does it make any sense, does it? And here is uh, here's some examples of the Susquehanna River um, in um, Pennsylvania, a heavy tree gap in Alice Springs is another classic example. Um, and
fascinating things about rivers. This is a river flowing through a modern flood plain in uh, southern New South Wales near Beniloquin. And you can see the way the river meanders along through the flood plain. And uh, that you know, looks pretty normal. It's a fairly slow flowing river, so it wanders a bit. But with the aid of um, Google Earth, you can zoom back, and that white square is the previous image. So what you can see now is the floodplain itself was a once large meandering river. And the whole of the area around it was in fact the floodplain of that mega river. So somewhere in the past there was a massive flow of water coming off of the continent. And where did the water go? Where did all, sorry, where did all that sediment go? You know around every single continent on the earth there are things called continental shelves or continental margins. And uh, they extend out typically a couple hundred kilometres and then drops down deeply into the ocean basins. And geologists have wondered, well, how do the continental margins form? We know runoff from the flood makes a lot of sense. If you zoom into Perth over here, you see off the coast of Perth, opposite the Swan River, and you see that huge canyon which has been carved into the continental margin. That canyon is larger than Grand Canyon. There it is as a submarine canyon, illustrating once again the effects of the, the flood of water coming off the canyon. Now, I've got about seven minutes, but I think I'll, I'll chop through this pretty quickly because it's quite important. Immediately after the flood, when we talk about the volcanic eruptions in the flood, there would have been a lot of high altitude ash, which would have the tendency to block out the sun. It would have been a grey sky, fairly much colder. But the oceans were warm. All of that volcanic eruptions and the magma coming up through the, ocean, through the water. So you have a condition with warm oceans and cold land. Warm oceans means lots of evaporation. Cold land means it all comes down as ice and snow and sleet. You've got the conditions for an ice age. Now the secular geologists have struggled to figure out what causes an ice age. Simply lowering the temperature of the planet doesn't cause an ice age. That dries out the atmosphere and it doesn't cause what you need to produce huge volumes of ice over the surface of the Earth. And uh, there was a conference held recently that I looked over 20 years ago now, I see. Although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. But the conditions after the flood would have triggered the one and only ice age that I believe has ever happened. We can get a fair idea of the extent of the ice just by looking at glacial activity and evidence for that. And it didn't cover the whole of the Earth, as some Disney movies might have you believe. But probably the, um, you know, the, the regions around the polar uh, caps are leaving essentially the equatorial band free. So there's some interesting work done. This is done by a group called NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the US. And they looked at what the land mass of the Earth would look like if the ocean levels were lower by 100 metres. They looked at several levels, actually. But I've taken a 100 metre level here. So here we are, 100 metres below present sea level. Now what's interesting here is you can see that there are land bridges that are formed across the Bering Straits, linking England to Europe, <clears throat> all the way down through the Indonesian archipelago to Australia. So in fact, you could basically walk from Tasmania all the way to England or across the top of North America down to Tierra del Fuego. Now, during the Ice Age, a tremendous amount of, uh, of water was evaporated up and deposited down onto the Earth in the form of ice and snow and sleet and so on. The lowering would have formed land bridges in those places. So after the flood and after the Tower of Babel, people would have had, and animals, land bridges and ready migration paths all around the world to repopulate the planet. And then towards the end of the Ice Age, which would have lasted, people have estimated, somewhere between five and 700 years, the ocean levels rise again, breaking those land bridges and isolating those populations of people and animals. And we find some interesting distributions of animals around the world. It's called biogeography, which is quite a fascinating subject. 
for instance, there are jaguars found in South America and leopards found in Africa, which can hybridise. And you can hybridise them either way and produce a jaguar or a legua. Now, what that suggests is that jaguars and leopards were part of the big cat kind, whatever that kind looked like in the original creation. But here's a problem because those continents are supposed to have separated millions of years ago. So how can you have, and by the way, the offspring are fertile offspring. So the jagging part is a male jaguar and a female leopard. The legular is a male leopard and a female jaguar. But the evolutionary story struggles to explain that. It's not consistent with the fact that those continents separated over three million years ago because there would have been so much genetic drift since then that those two animals would not be able to hybridise, but they still can, pointing to the recency of the geographic changes that have happened. Here's another one, the distribution of monkeys, <coughs> which is quite interesting. There are a number of different monkeys, so you can imagine that from uh, Africa, they could migrate into Asia and so on, but how did they get to South America? I mean, but once again, that gap appears to be way too big. But not a problem when you look at it from a biblical point of view. The major challenge to explain uh, from an evolutionary point of view. So let me just wrap this up a bit to why this is important. This guy, Frank Zimmer, was in a debate and he wrote this <clears throat> and said, the most devastating thing though that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know that Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. And if there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a saviour. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. And he concluded by saying, I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. His last sentence is right. If evolution is true, folks, the Bible's not, and we don't have a meaningful faith. Can you see why the enemy is so intent on indoctrinating our culture with the belief in the millions of years and the random processes? Because it undercuts the very gospel message itself. And ironically, it takes an atheist to see the truth. But we're called upon to demolish arguments at every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And I would suggest to you that belief in evolution is probably the greatest pretension that stops people coming to know God. Think about it. How can you come to know someone that you don't even believe exists? I mean, <laughs> you know, you can't get past the first step, can you? So that's why we need to be equipped. That's why we have our website, which is an absolute goldmine of answers to the challenges that you'll come up against. And I think I mentioned yesterday, we have this email service for creation info bites. And it gives you, it comes about once every one or two weeks and gives you a good overview or summary of the best articles on creation.com. Mm -hmm. And if you give us your postcode, then we can let you know if events are happening in your area. And your first email gives you a free video download Now, Jenny's prepared a form which doesn't look like that. No. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Sorry. She has got that form <laughs> over there. So just put your name, your email address, obviously, and your postcode. And if you sign up for InfoBytes, we'll let you have one of these little booklets. Um, I don't know if we've run out of stones and bones, but if we have, then some of the other ones as uh, a free gift. Uh, also, I mentioned the Creation Magazine at the beginning, written for lay people, a fantastic resource comes out four times a year and you can subscribe to that for one or three years and if you subscribe you'll get a free back issue. Now the beauty of this is that it's a fantastic witnessing tool and um, I think I might have shared this one yesterday uh, but it's worth sharing again. Someone gave this guy a creation magazine and it led him into the kingdom because it cleared away the intellectual obstacles he had to committing himself to the Lord. But what he did next is the impressive bit too. Because then it said, I, subs I subscribe for 
five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. Praise God. What a fabulous witnessing tool it is. Now, we don't have this form, unfortunately. Jenny's made up a different one. We just need to have your name, address, and contact details, and so on. And if you're already a subscriber, which I think quite a few of you are, give some thought to whether there's someone in your life, family, or friend that you could give a gift subscription to. Jenny can organise that as well. And for every three-year subscription, you'll get a $15 voucher, which you can use on any of the products on the table there. One of the best ways to spend $15 is on the Creation Answers book because it answers the most asked questions that Christians and non-Christians alike have. We've got some great stuff on geology, Biblical Geology 101, which is quite a new book, uh, an excellent resource. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great little book, The Deep Time Deception. And Michael Ward goes through all the claims for the millions of years and mm -hmm. points out how the same evidence can be better interpreted in the light of the Bible. If any of you are in late high school or know people going into university, this is a great little booklet, The Creation Survival Guide, How to Graduate with Your Faith Intact, and give you some excellent uh, material there. <coughs> I think we sold the only copy of this we had with us, the Genesis Academy, which by the way is a free study guide with it, but if you're interested, uh, Jenny can take a back order for that, and you therefore get it post free. And this is a 12 DVD set. Each session is about 35 minutes. It's fantastic for use in Bible study groups. And we have a very wide variety of uh, videos and what have you available at creation.com. So thank you very much for your attention. Warning tea is now served. So let me stop.